We're going to move in the direction of blood flow. We're going to move on to the aortic valve. And our next speaker, Dr. Rob Optican, just made a big move. Uh, he's been in practice for many years. Has just returned to Durham, North Carolina, where he did his residency a, a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn. Let me make sure this gets. All right. They're syncing up my slides here. Hope you all aren't too hungry yet. All right. All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rob Optikin from Duke. We're going to spend the next 15 minutes or so reviewing the basics of aortic stenosis. I have no disclosures. Our objectives today are fourfold. First, we'll review the basic anatomy of the aortic valve, then discuss the etiology and physiology of valvular aortic stenosis. Then, next, review the diagnosis of aortic stenosis, including its grading and staging. And lastly, examine treatment options and treatment guidelines. In their typical tri-leaflet configuration, aortic valve leaflets themselves are named for the coronary sinus at which each leaflet is attached in a semicircular fashion. For example, the left coronary leaflet attaches to the left coronary sinus, the right to the right, and so on. We'll touch upon bicuspid valves in a second. As an aside, realize that there are rare variants of quadricuspid and even unicuspid aortic configurations, but they're beyond the scope of our talk. The leaflets are incredibly thin. They're composed of a few thin layers of fibrous connective tissue covered on both sides by a thin layer of endothelial cells. They're self-supported during closure by the nature of the aortic root attachment, and hence there's no need for papillary muscles. Aortic stenosis is the most common valvular heart disease in the developed world. Its prevalence is about two in a thousand for 50-year-olds, but rises to 100 per thousand in 80-year-olds. Age-related degeneration accounts for the majority of aortic stenosis cases in the U.S. The typical risk factors for aortic stenosis are the same as those for garden variety atherosclerosis, such as hypertension, smoking, etc. Bicuspid aortic valve anatomy leads to such degeneration much more rapidly than occurs with normal tricuspid anatomy. And please note that there are several configurations of bicuspid valve anatomy as well as multiple naming conventions which are beyond the scope of this 15-minute presentation. Rheumatic aortic stenosis still occurs but is less common in the developed world nowadays as a result of antibiotic tr uh, treatment for group A strep. This is an illustration from the Mayo Clinic, but I think it's, it's really illustrative. Physiologically, you can envision the progression of aortic stenosis in the same manner as you would for a garden variety hose with progressively narrower nozzles. As the nozzle outlet becomes narrower, given the same need for fluid flow, pressure inside the hose elevates and the velocity of flow through the opening increases. If it could, the lining of the hose might thicken in response to such elevated pressures, analogous to the concentric myocardial hypertrophy, which develops as a result to progressive long-standing aortic stenosis. Uh-oh. Let's see. There we go. Classically, there are three most common presenting symptoms in patients with aortic stenosis. Congestive heart failure, exertional angina, and syncope. While it might be simple to understand the mechanisms for syncope and congestive heart failure as a result of limitation in transvalvular flow, the mechanism for angina, even in the setting of relatively normal coronary arteries, is a bit more complex. This diagram illustrates our current understanding of the myocardial hypertrophy, which develops as a result of chronically elevated left ventricular pressures, and it causes a resultant increase in left ventricular wall stress. This not only increases myocardial oxygen demand, but diminishes coronary flow reserve due to accentuated extravascular compression as well as diminished capillary density. These processes together are what lead to relative myocardial ischemia and hence angina, even in the setting of normal coronary arteries. The hope and treatment for aortic stenosis is to relieve the stenosis early rather than waiting before it's too late to help the patient. This is an, an illustration from a classic publication from Ross and Brownwald more than a half century ago, and it illustrates the rapid diminution in survival once symptoms become apparent. 
the steepest decline occurring after the onset of congestive heart failure. While we as radiologists might suggest a diagnosis of aortic stenosis due to post-stenotic aortic dilatation on a plain radiograph or dense aortic valve calcification on CT, the most useful screening tool to make the diagnosis is an old-fashioned stethoscope. As you may remember, the classic aortic stenosis finding is a systolic crescendo, decrescendo murmur loudest in the right parasternal region. I won't make any orthopedic jokes here, but anyway, you, you guys get the deal with the stethoscope. Confirmation of the diagnosis will then require accurate velocity measurements from echocardiography. Remember the garden hose analogy. The tighter the outflow opening, the higher the velocity achieved by fluid exiting the nozzle. The most reliable echocardiographic measurements include peak jet velocity, mean valvular pressure gradient, and valve area, which is obtained from a derived calculation. Stenosis can then be graded as mild, moderate, severe, or very severe, depending on where the measurements best fit within these categories. The American College of, Cardi uh, College of Cardiology also outlines the following clinical stages for aortic stenosis. Stage A is at risk for stenosis, but having normal gradients. Progression to stage B is manifested by diminished leaflet excursion and mild to moderate stenosis by echo parameters. Stage C is then characterized by severe or very severe stenosis using echo parameters, but remaining asymptomatic. And then stage D is exactly the same as stage C, but now exhibiting clinical symptoms such as angina, heart failure, or syncope. There's a big caveat in grading aortic stenosis. Some patients with severe or very severe aortic stenosis and clearly having valve areas below one square centimeter have such poor left ventricular systolic function that they cannot generate enough power to provide the velocities and pressure gradients typically used in echocardiographic uh, grading. This is known in the cardiology world as low flow aortic stenosis. And you'll hear more about this as you continue in your clinical lives. Are there choices for medical therapy? Since the histologic process of aortic stenosis is similar to that of atherosclerosis, many studies have examined statin therapy to slow progression of disease. These studies have shown that statins just don't really help. That leaves us with surgical treatments for aortic stenosis. Well, first, before we talk about the surgical treatments, what are the surgical indications? Well, to simplify, there are three main indications. Anyone with very severe aortic stenosis is a candidate. Those patients with severe aortic stenosis who are symptomatic or have worsening hemodynamics on follow-up or are undergoing another type of cardiac surgery, such as cabbage, are all candidates. And lastly, those with moderate aortic stenosis who are planning to undergo another type of cardiac surgery, such as cabbage, are also candidates. Well, what are the surgical options? The simplest but least effective is balloon valvuloplasty. It's currently only used for urgent palliation and is becoming quite rare. Surgical aortic valve replacement and transcatheter aortic valve replacement now form the real menu of options for aortic stenosis treatment. Mechanical aortic valve replacements date back to the 1960s with Dr. Starr and Edwards. An illustration of the metamorphosis of mechanical valves from left to right shows some examples. The first generation Star edwards valve used a caged ball design. Later, engineers developed the tilting single disc valve, illustrated by the bjork shiley tilting disc valve, which is second from the left. More recently, and still in use are the bileaflet mechanical valves, which include the St. Jude bileaflet and the Onyx bileaflet. The newer generation valves provide more physiologic flow than earlier generation valves and are less likely to cause red blood cell shearing. Mechanical valves share the advantages of relatively easy implantation, high durability. Some of these valves can last upwards of 30 years. Unfortunately, they require lifelong warfarin therapy to prevent blood clot formation. Newer studies are examining the substitute feasibility of long-term eloquist therapy, but this is still under investigation. The next category of surgical valve replacements are the bioprosthetic valves. 
Stented bioprosthetic valves include the Edwards on the far left and the St. Jude to its right. Most stented bioprosthetic valves consist of a bovine pericardium draped around a metallic stent. They offer easy implantation and no need for anticoagulation, but they do undergo structural degeneration over time. These valves typically last about half as long as today's mechanical valves. Typically, the lifespan of a stented bioprosthetic is about 15 years, plus or minus. The freestyle St. Jude xenograft on the far right is an entire preserved porcine aortic root, including the valve leaflets and sinuses. Although harder to implant, it has better hemodynamics and requires no anticoagulation. It is best suited to patients not only requiring a new valve, but a new aortic root. Like other bioprosthetic valves, xenografts undergo structural degeneration over time. Aortic homographs are taken from human donor hearts, otherwise not suitable for heart transplant. They are characterized by difficult implantation and relatively rapid degeneration. Homographs are usually reserved to replace valves destroyed by endocarditis because they are less likely to become reinfected immediately after reimplantation. Just as it sounds, the Ross autograph procedure takes the patient's own pulmonic root and transposes it into the aortic position. Then an aortic homograft or xenograft is placed into the pulmonic position. This autograft can last a long time as the autograft tissue is actually viable and the pulmonic valve homograft or xenograft lasts longer than it would in the aortic position due to less stress. The main advantage of this graft is that there's no need for anticoagulation and is very long lasting. Some movie fans may remember that Arnold Schwarzenegger had symptomatic aortic stenosis in his 40s due to a bicuspid valve. The Ross procedure was recommended to him at the time due to his young age at the time of his initial surgery and obviously the physical demands of his profession. The Ross procedure's drawback is that it is very difficult. This brings us up to the most recent surgical treatment for aortic stenosis and now the most popular, the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. TAVR was somewhat famously the treatment offered to then 75-year-old Mick Jagger just a few years ago. I showed this talk to my residents recently. They didn't know who this guy was. It was hilarious. <laughs> Transcatheteric valves were first deployed 13 years ago. They were initially validated by the Partner One trial, showing their effectiveness in patients who were unsuitable for open surgery then validated by Partner 2, which compared their effectiveness to surgery in intermediate surgical risk patients, and even further validated by Partner 3, comparing them to low-risk surgical patients. TAVR performed as well or better than open surgery in all of these trials. Let's see. And the moral of the story now, TAVR is now by far the most utilized type of aortic valve replacement in the United States. So in general, this is a real statistic, eight out of nine aortic valve replacements done today in the U.S. are TAVRs. That just, I think that's incredible. The most common categories of TAVRs in use are shown here today. The Sapien, which is made by Edwards, is balloon expandable. The core valve in the middle is made by Mectrotic. It's self-expanding. And the Lotus valve, which has been recalled recently, was mechanically expanding. Let's watch, if we can, will this play? Can you guys, there we go. Let's watch a cartoon illustrating the deployment of a sapien balloon expanded valve. This takes a, a few seconds, so please bear with me. But first, using ephemeral approach, wire crosses the aortic valve into the left ventricle. Then the balloon-mounted collapsed sapien valve is delivered through a sheath over the wire and it's meticulously positioned and repositioned in the aortic root. You'll notice that during balloon expansion and valve deployment that the ventricles are overdrive paced into a temporary tachycardia that reduces the pressure felt by the device during balloon expansion. This allows the device to maintain its desired position until the balloon is then deflated and blood can once again traverse the aortic route. All right, 
trying to advance here. Can you guys advance that for me? There we go, thanks. CT angiography plays a key role in the success of transcatheter aortic valve implantation by providing a roadmap for cardiac surgeons and cardiologists as they determine the eligibility of candidates for TAVR, as well as matching the patient for the type of TAVR device appropriate for each patient. Many different vendors offer automated solutions for this task, but all of them require radiologist supervision. TAVR has a lot of advantages over surgical AVR. It's much less invasive and much less expensive. It has similar perioperative and one-year morbidity mortality. No need for anticoagulation. It also has disadvantages, and this is not a complete list. Heart block is one, was referred to by our most recent speaker. Paravalvular leak, another. Issues with interference with coronary osteo blood flow in the aortic root. Issues with iliac uh, artery stenosis or tortuosity, which can impair delivery. And there's one more, long-term durability, which we actually don't know. So the partner trials all investigated uh, the comparison of this to surgical AVR over a year. We don't know how long these are going to last. They've only been in use for upwards almost of 13 years. We don't know how long they will last. The American College of Cardiology provides an algorithm outlining the type of valve replacement which may be best for an individual patient, taking into account their age, their anticoagulation risk, and the unique patient anatomic details. And I won't go into this slide in detail. But it's a, great, uh, it's a great slide to have as you're looking through algorithms and helping your clinicians guide their thoughts. In summary, we've reviewed the etiology, physiology, and symptoms of aortic stenosis, discussed the diagnosis, grading, and staging of aortic stenosis, and touched on the treatment options and treatment guidelines. And I thank you very much for your attention.